didn't. Okay, so I can take. In. Yeah. Can you? Do you have a stick that you can use? I have a stick. Yes, of course. Yeah, so, so I can copy maybe. it over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one, okay. So let's go in. Um, well, um, I think this is PowerPoint. Huh? This is this is the no, no, I need power. I, I think this is PowerPoint. Huh? Because it will really, really frustrate you. I'm, I'm not an Apple guy, so no, therefore, no, sorry. Fine. I'm just going to switch just on. on. Just open PowerPoint. Where is this one here? This is my key, oh, yeah. This is your key. Okay. I just need Still. PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. just open. Just so PowerPoint. It doesn't open. Ah, okay. Yeah, it will do. It will do. I think so. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Which, which one? Yeah, so bio, biomed, yes. Let me just think about it. Open. I just want to examine. It looks like a happy. It looks good. Not that fast, but anyway. It's a big presentation. Ah, Eureka. Here we go. Sorry for the technical delay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I'm usually working on the Windows, and this is an Apple system, so therefore excuse me here for being so unprofessional for the starting year. So my name is Ulrich Walter. I'm coming here from IBM, and I will talk to you in the next 20 minutes about a little about infrastructure requirements we need for AI in medical research and, of course, in science. And, of course, we can see this has been a dramatic increase of possibilities what we can do with compute power and storage today. But I will give you also and shed a light a little on what we are doing in IBM. And some of you have probably seen the exhibition hall already, our research team here from Rüschlikon. So I'm from the infrastructure side. They are on the research side. So we work together, but we are in separate LAs here within IBM. 
So the topic is what we are talking today is coming from data to knowledge, from knowledge to actions, and, 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 and especially uh, what, what can be done here and what are the requirements here on the technical side. Then we will talk about um, technology because technology is one of the enablers we have here in, in, uh, in AI and machine learning. And of course, at the end of our presentation, I will show you also a couple of examples what we can do today, but there are much, much more to come. And I have one hour, okay. Even one hour, even better, even better. So, <laughs> okay. So, okay, anyway. So what we are doing in IBM, we have a broad field of research. And of course, I can encourage every one of you just uh, look up at the IBM.com research page what type of uh, research we are undertaking here in any field in, in compute, but also, of course, in other areas like um, in, in, in blockchain for a very secure uh, data connectivity between various systems, and also quantum computing, which has become of fame recently, and a couple of new things to come. For those of you who have not heard about quantum computing, this is a technology. I think this will change dramatically also the way how we do computing computing in the future. It is not a replacement to be for traditional computing, but will help us actually to gain access to things or to compute examples here, what are not possible today to be done. So therefore, a hell lot of things are going on, especially about quantum computing. To be honest, today uh, I see quantum computing in, in its infancy, but maybe in the next 10 to 20 years, we will see really great results coming in with quantum computing. This is really something for, uh, you should definitely focus on in the future of your career. Internet of Things is also a very exciting thing, especially also for healthcare and data science. Not sure who of you have heard about, let's say, um, electronic tattoos, where you can actually take a tattoo on your skin, and with the tattoo you can um, transmit about 140 indicators from your sweat of your of your body, actually to do analysis of the behavior of a certain person. This was a, a result done by MIT, L'Oreal, and IBM. I think about a couple of three years ago. Quite exciting things to come here as well. Security, I think everything, everyone is focusing today on security in any kind because if you want to have, let's say, um, secure systems in the, in the internet of everything, then therefore, of course, security plays a high role and there are a couple of things to come and change the world dramatically. But also cloud computing, and I have seen a couple of presentations before when people are talking about cloud computing and they don't really understand what the risks and uh, side effects are of cloud computing, especially in questions of security, but also in economics like uh, data movement and so on. If you have, let's say, a large, huge um, genomic projects, you know what it means actually to transport a couple of terabytes maybe of data to cloud and haul it back maybe maybe to your data center in your, in your own institute. That means actually there's a hell lot of um, considerations to be taken here in cloud, which of course is a great thing to come, but of course I see it actually as a site play and an important, very important site play, but as an additional, let's say, arm we can take for our compute power here. And IBM is very much here in the game of hybrid cloud where we take the advantages of an on-premise solution with the combined possibilities within cloud service providers and what can be done here. System design, I will come to that closely. The same with semiconductor technology, where actually presently we are coming to an end, uh, to be honest, here on um, the, the technology level. So Moore's law and Amdahl's rules actually and um, are coming to close because the number of, um, of the, the grade of, minor, um, of, of, of factory um, capabilities is coming close to the end of seven nanometer technology. That means actually we cannot go deeper 
deeper because of the atomic layers in a single chip. So therefore, we will see a new kind of chips will arise in the next coming years. So there's a bright and possible great future here. I recently was at the International Supercomputing in Frankfurt that is hosted once a year in Frankfurt, and the other one is hosted in the US as supercomputing. And um, I found it quite funny because John Sean from Lawrence Livermore said, we are now coming to the Cambrium of um, IT. The Cambrium time, as you know, was actually the time where biodiversity exploded in huge numbers. And the same is going to happen maybe here in computing chips in the future. I have some examples here for you later on. Biology, I think uh, this is nothing new for you, so I don't have to mention that here in, in, in deep uh, details. And physical science, these are some of the research areas where we are in. And IBM uh, maintains a couple of research institutes around the world. One of them is, is very close to here. It's in Rüschlikon in Zurich. And the others are in Bangalore in the US, in Almaden in uh, Japan, but also I think in Brazil we have one. And in India, of course. So a couple of research in Tel Aviv, we have a couple of research institutes and they're all linked together with uh, other research institutes around the world, large universities and other bodies here. Um, before we give, begin in the presentation, I think that's a great message. So I have an hour to spend. I have, and <laughs> that's, uh, that's good because I have a, a nice movie. I'm not sure if you have seen that movie before, but I thought maybe that's something of um, what I like to show you here is my mouse. Uh, mouse? Do I have a mouse? Ah, here it is. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see if it works here on screen. Maybe you have seen that movie before, but I thought it's worthwhile to explain it. So you are not connected to the internet, okay? So we don't do that movie here. <laughs> No? Okay, uh, but, but of course, if um, in the movie, in the movie, it's explained actually how a digital twin of a of a real human can be done. And today we have the technologies and the capabilities to really sort out what can be done here to analyze each individual cell of a body and even do, let's say, individual things for protection, individual medicine, and biology analytics. Here, this is a movie not coming from IBM. But that's a movie that was shown actually from, I think it was someone from Harvard last week, uh, last month here in, in Frankfurt of the university. And that's something, of course, I would recommend that you have a close look. It's very, very great animated and it's a really good message you have in here. On the other hand, I uh, also advise, I'm also a member of the IEEE. There are a lot of communities here focusing on biomedical things and research within um, uh, some of you may also be are already a member here, so that's also something I want to share with you here at that, at that point. So here now comes the fun part of the presentation. That's usually I say here in Germany about uh, people are very cautious about artificial intelligence in general. So I think about three of them would say that can re AI systems could replace their bosses in the future, but also AI could replace a lot of other jobs in the future as well. So therefore, there's such a lot of things going on. In the US, of course, Obama said in his, one of his speeches before he left office, he said his successor will govern the country by using artificial intelligence. Not sure, I think we are still in the beta phase there, but maybe maybe something will come. He's using more, I think, social networks today, but of course that was, a, but of course this was an official Obama's message in here, yeah. So where do we stand today on the level of artificial intelligence in general? So we are presently here on the border between a narrow and a broad AI. What do I mean with a narrow or broad AI? Um, first of all, I think the name or the term intelligence in any case is not quite right, if you agree, because uh, we have not such an intelligent system. We have, let's say, a specialized focused system that is dedicated to a very certain task to identify maybe a certain cancer or a certain form of genomics or whatever else. But of course, it's not an artificial intelligence that is said, well, I, don't, I understand everything from everybody 
and I can reason and conclude and can make a therapy or may, can, may, uh, can uh, recommend um, any, any um, other things here as a system. So therefore, of course, we are still here in a very limited way uh, today. But of course, we will see in broad AI, and this is capable because of new technologies to come, that we have, let's say, multitask, multi-domain types of artificial intelligence. And this is definitely something, of course, uh, which is coming not in the next future. This is happening today already. So we can see behavior and we can reason and conclude between a couple of varieties and dependencies, each be, um, how they depend to each other. That's something I think very important, especially in bioscience and um, also in other things like security. The term general AI, that's something you may have heard of as well, is something we can see in the very far future. Some people say it will happen until 2050, others say maybe not even in this century, and general AI actually describes a system that is really, let's say, building some, some intelligence like really a human. It can reason, it can, can conclude, it can understand, and it can autonomously learn from other things. If this is going to happen, okay, let's wait for the future. I recently was reading a report, I think it was from a US magazine, I'm not sure it was, it was, from which magazine it was, but there are tests going on meanwhile, of course, that you can say we can implant, uh, they are t considering to implant some chips and connect them to brain um, uh, neurons, so you have, let's say, some intelligence actually rebuilt into your brain and maybe in the future even you could uh, uh, cure of that some, some cases like um, 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 Alzheimer or other diseases maybe uh, that's to become. But of course this is really something of future technologies to come. So use cases today, what we have in, in, in functional AI, there are a couple of things everybody is using every day, for example, like language translation, speech transcription, very simple things actually. But of course, it can be quite hard because the question is, what is the level of accuracy you are looking for? If you are happy with a, with a lousy transcription, then okay. But of course, if you have, let's say, to make a diagnose, or if you have to make, let's say, a recommendation based on a patient's uh, disease um, information, you want probably to have a much higher accuracy. That means also, let's say, a better um, neural network and also, of course, a b a better algorithms in between. Language understanding, face recognition, these are some of the technologies we see today. But uh, by the way, things like face recognition or even skin detection are becoming more, let's say, of a challenge because of biased AI. You may have heard about the name biased AI, where people say, well, um, for example, if you have some certain colors or if you have some certain behaviors or whatever, then a system could potentially actually make a decision not to provide, let's say, a credit or maybe Maybe he comes to a wrong decision just because it's a biased system. So therefore, IBM is very keen on that to remove, let's say, the bias of a system decision because of, let's say, fairness of the fairness of the system. Machine reasoning is another thing here. Yeah, and the other thing is, of course, the number of data. All AI systems today, and what you are talking about here, is depending on data. Without any data, we cannot do anything. Data is actually the ground source of everything. So we need actually a lot of data to do what we are looking for to do. I'm not the expert on biodiversity and bioscience, but of course in automotive, I give you an example. Just to get better than 20% of the average driver of the average driver of a global level, I'm not talking about the German or the Indian or the, the American drivers, I'm talking on the global level, 20% better, it takes approximately 15 billion kilometers to drive on a car to, con to, to, to collect the data, the movies, and all the information for training a system that way that it actually can cap can cap up with the capabilities I was just discussing here. That is a lot of data, you can imagine, so we are talking about exa and zettabytes of data to be collected. And the same is true if you want to do, let's say, some experiments and you need to have, let's say, patterns of genomics or you have to have patterns of other things 
that drives a lot of demand on the storage side for data. So we are not talking about here in the, in the terabyte space. I'm talking, for example, with my friends at Fraunhofer and uh, uh, or the, color, uh, the guys at the German Institute of Artificial Intelligence, the FKI. We are here in the far petabyte reach already here for some certain runs of, of trainings for, for some analytics. So therefore, this is quite a lot. And the numbers are really, uh, let's say, astonishing here because back in 2003, the whole world actually was not even on a single day that much data than we are producing now, maybe even in an hour. That's really something very exciting here to see. And the whole mankind, by the way, did not actually produce so much data in the last combined 5,000 years in a single, as we are doing now in a single day. So every one of us here is taking pictures, everyone is writing something, everyone is actually taking movies. So this is all some of the data we are collecting. And especially in medicine and especially MRT, CRMs and other technologies are causing a lot of data to be collected and of course to be stored away and efficiently handled. Coming to data in AI, you have to consider, and this is a very important thing, this is a generic view on AI, not on the technology, but um, actually on the phases you have to consider, and also on the, on the data we are talking here. In the phases, when you, when you take data, you have, first of all, you have to rely on that data. Otherwise, of course, if you have false information, false positive, so as we say, then of course your result can be worthless because you have to have trust in your data. This is one of the most critical things. But the other things, as well as that, you need to consider what is the number of data we are collecting here. Are we talking about terabytes, megabytes, gigabytes? How can this storage be, how can this data be stored efficiently and effectively and of course in the question of speed we needed to have it for our analytics or maybe for our AI systems in the future. We also need to consider the variability of data. Are we talking about the same data type or are we ta talking about different data types that needs to be merged together to make a homogenization of data? That's also some of the questions in here. The variability, the value of the data at the end of the day can be, let's say, unprecedented because you need to understand if you have a proven and true data set, that can be worth millions because this is really something that may be collected over years for to be established. And if you have such a pure and really cleared data set, that's something, of course, people are looking in in very much detail here. It's satellite images, for example, from NASA, you can get from the website, but of course, if you want to have the real ones, you have to pay a lot of money for some of the cleared data sets here. The same is true in medicine, the same is true in many other disciplines we see around the globe. So data is really, let's say, some people say the new oil, but I think this is really um, some kind of a gold mine if you have, let's say, the right data set in here. And for our training, we have to consider you have the collection phase, where the data has been collected, the preparation phase, the analytics phase, the learning phase, and last, of least, uh, last not least, the inference phase, where actually the data is being brought into an AI system who may, a may uh, become to a recommendation or actually also, of course, to an action on that. In AI systems in general, it's very important you have to consider the three very important facts. The so first of all is how does my system scale? What type of technology do I need for doing that? How many systems do I need? Is it just actually a single PC do I need? Or maybe do I need a data center full of equipment like we have in Oak Ridge where we presently are running the largest HPC computer on the planet? Or is it actually something in, the, in between, or maybe a some of the technology bricks? The other thing is a, que is a question of time. How long will it take to get my results? I was talking to some of the friends at Max Planck in Frankfurt um, maybe a half year ago, and they were doing some exercises on AI, doing X-ray images, actually training for their models. But of course, the poor guys, they just had, let's say, some high-performance PCs with some GTC uni um, uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And of course, some of the runs were taken over six or eight weeks. So that means, actually, if, if you are happy with 
the result coming over then after eight weeks of training time, maybe that's fine, but of course there are technologies and can do better. So time may become a very critical factor, especially if you want to do such trainings more often and not just on an individual data set. And last but not least, as I said before, a very important point is what level of accuracy are you aiming for? If you are saying, okay, I'm happy with my accuracy of 50% or 60%, that's fine with me, but if I would get a cure or maybe a therapy on, on let's say, an accuracy of 50%, I'm not sure if I would, let's say, take this as a, as a result here. So therefore, of course, especially in science, it's very important to aim for higher levels of accuracy and of course comparisons also with some other groups so I can really say well this is something of course we have seen many a times and my results here definitely can be better because of the better data but better data quality and of course the better algorithms we were using in here so why is this all happening today well we have that big data thing today it's not a thing that we cannot afford to store data and, and, and storage. If you would have done some of the experiments I was just talking about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it would be financially impossible to do that, to be honest, because actually technology was, in at the days, not capable, not just it was not capable to do that, but it was not capable in questions of economical efficiency here. So you would have taken a lot of storage systems, tons of storage systems, very expensive ones, just to simulate uh, the number of um, performance or capacity you can get in a system today. My little USB stick I have here is just about 16 gigabyte. If you go back 20 years in time and want to buy a, t a t 16 gigabyte disk, this was really money at the day. Today you get 16 gigabyte as a giveaway in, in a McDonald's or somewhere else. So therefore, of course, storage actually was brought down in questions of capacity to dramatically dramatic numbers and the efficiency of storage has increased also dramatically over time. The other thing is, uh, maybe you have uh, read the books, there are a couple of nice books I have seen here from MIT, from Alex Kwaszewski, um, the neural network uh, things to come. So this is actually something, of course, um, this is not a new technology, by the way. This is really old stuff, back going back in 1956 to Dartmouth conference and even f further with Alan Turing, actually, this first model. So this is not something very new. But the problem actually was, uh, in those days it was absolutely impossible to have a computer in that size was kept able to do what a neural network in the quality and especially in the number of um, uh, parameters what we are talking about today is kept able to do. So therefore, of course, we had the so-called time of the AI winter. This is a period from, let's say, 1961 or 62 until the late 80s. Well, actually, uh, everybody was saying, yes, AI is something very important, but of course, it's economically and technically not possible to do. So this is actually something that has changed dramatically over time. The same was true for our CPUs, our core units in the computers. The CPU was also actually achieving in the last years, still even knowing that Moore's law will come to an end, a dramatic increase in questions of transistors, in questions of per, uh, performance, and of course in questions of threats. Some people ask me sometimes, why don't we do a neuro neuroformic uh, way like to make a assembly of the human brain? There are projects going on, you well know, uh, about uh, simulating the human brain really in a computer. Everybody was uh, looking like that, like Frankenstein building really a human brain in a computer. But that's not really working today because the neurons in a really brain and the cortex are connected on a square millimeter each one to each other that would require about a three kilometer, three kilometer wire in a single chip on a single square, um, a cubic millimeter. That means actually this is still not possible to be done physically on a system today, considering also the necessity to have, let's say, these tiny and uh, granular fibers within a, within a switch. There are new technologies to come, maybe optical technologies that can serve that in the future, but here we are on the very much of the beginning of the technology. But as I said before, 
it's not the CPU alone that can survive here. We need to have, let's say, new technologies, specialized hardware accelerators, and that's something to come. I give you another example on here. Back in, in, in 2012, the Google Brain project was existing with about 16,000 systems. Imagine that, 16,000 computers. You could fill a hallway like that, much more with computers, and you would just get out about 50 teraflops. This is, this is not a big number today. This is really something very, um, let's say, limited in questions of performance. And in, back in 2015, uh, this is just about four years ago, and, and NVIDIA came out with a Pascal GPU and three of those tiny GPUs actually had the equivalent of 62 teraflops, but just as you can see, with the power equivalent of just 0 0.9 kilowatts of power. That means the dramatic here is that the performance and the miniaturization of the technology was now available for everybody. Of course, it was still an expensive card. It was, I think, about 10K or so, but if you, if you compare compare 10K for a single card in the comparison to 16,000 systems on the left-hand side plus the energy you have to spend here and all the other costs, this is nothing. And therefore, of course, the, the advantage of technology will increase. And about two years ago, in 2017, NVIDIA created the last one of its um, um, animals here on the zoo. It's a Tesla card. And each single Tesla card is now capable of 120 teraflops. That means you get um, more than two times the Google brain from 2012 in a single card of that size. Everybody is actually capable to buy such, such, such a card. And I'll come to that later in a single zoo system today, we can implement up to six of such cards that gives you a performance of a powerhouse and unprecedented actually before. So this is something, of course, everyone is now capable to take and take the advantage of that and use it as an infrastructure building block for any kind of high performance computing. Why is it actually um, so important to have such GPUs? What is actually the difference between a GPU and a CPU? Why do we need that? Well, if you look in a traditional CPU, we have the so-called von Neumann problem. You have, maybe have heard about that, okay? The von Neumann problem is actually the problem that our CPU has a very limited range of addressing the RAM. This is some technology, I don't go into very much details in here, but it was actually a problem that was coming over time. And it is not solved on the CPU, so therefore, of course, in the future, as we continue with traditional CPUs, all of them will have the same problem here. We are still back in that situation. With a, with a GPU, we now actually can take a much better advantage here in questions of performance of a single system because a GPU in comparison to a CPU has a tremendous load more of the CPU cores. It has also CPUs, a GPU, but they are different. They are different to optimize and they are actually different in design. So therefore a modern GPU contains about 5,000 to 6,000 cores and each of those cores is specialized for doing special mathematical operations like matrix multiplication and of course vector calculation. This is some of the advantages of having such a GPU, and therefore, of course, my CPU will probably become then the I.O. engine for such a GPU. In the future, we will see much more technologies to come. Like I said before, we have GPUs, we have IPUs, we have maybe TPUs, like you see in, in, in Google's own technology here. IBM is, uh, research is doing a true north chip, which has a tremendous low energy footprint. That means actually you don't need a lot of power. I think it uh, takes even just actually your skin or something to, to power up such a chip, so that can become a system then or can become a component in a system that can be in a variable system or elsewhere here to collect data but also do some computations. And of course, like I said, quantum computing. This is not the end of the story. There are hundreds of other developments going on in any direction. So that's what I said before at ISC when John Shaw said uh, we are living in the cambrium of, of computers. I think that he was right. 
The challenge what I can see from a practical point of view is actually how to gain really the right technology at a certain uh, point in time and how do I build my ecosystem because each technology requires actually software, each technology requires actually development and so on and so forth. So therefore, of course, if I cannot make a recommendation today what will become the technology standard within the ten next 10 years, but of course, there, um, just monitor what's going on today. And still, vector GPUs and uh, the combination with CPUs, that's something, of course, very much in, in line today with our development. But the future will see different technologies to appear. Another thing is on the right hand side, we see also a lot, especially for high performance computing, um, a special uh, development going on in the four regions of the world, in China, Japan, and uh, the US, and also Europe. Every region is now researching on their own chip and on their own operating system. So there uh, might be also in the future some very exciting things to come. Um, so it will be not such a hom homogeneous world as we have seen it in the last 20, 30 years. So there will be a new world to come, especially in IT, and therefore, of course, um, just monitor that. Okay. When we look in our AI system, coming back to that, I think a very important point I made before was about the training. We have to differentiate between training and the action. The training phase, this is actually the time where you consume most of your compute power, where you take on most of your data and all of that actually in consideration for running such an event. That means what we said before, we have our collection phase, we have our analytics phase, we have our preparation phase, and the other three phases learn, and also the inference model. That's, uh, I think these are the three uh, the phases we see in our training phase. On the action side, then of course we need to have something, of course we have a sensor, we have a perception, we have a cognition, and we have also an actuator who makes a recommendation or is doing some, let's say, um, analytics here and gives some uh, proposals. Um, this is, of course, a very important point because I give you an example. My, my wife recently was in a doctor with an MRT and she was uh, suffering of a bad, uh, of, of some, some um, um, pains in her side and she was not sure what it was. So they sent her to an MRT and the MRT said, well, there is nothing. But then, of course, she said, well, I still have my pain. I don't know what is actually, what the sit system, uh, what, what the situation is. So she was sent again to a doctor who was doing that some, let's say, research and, and diagnosis in a traditional, more traditional way using some uh, sonographic and, and other devices here. And he found out that he, she, she has a kidney stone. But um, imagine that, and if you just trust a system who is just telling you maybe there's nothing and you sh send um, some patients away, or maybe actually your, your recommendation will be going the wrong direction. That means, of course, that such a system needs to be in, a, in such a way that a doctor or somebody who makes a decision can really rely on the results of that. So therefore, of course, the actionable side is very important here, especially when we talk about results. And in the five phases of AI, we have the five phases. These are, uh, let's say, a circle we have always to consider. No matter if you are in bioscience, in medicine, or in automotive, or in any way of AI, that's always the same stuff here, because you always have to, to rely on data, on, da on real-world data, and the data can come from any kind of source. It can be a sensor, it can be a text file, it can be some whatever images, it can be a movie, but of course the question is, how can I extract the information out of that data to be analyzed and to be trained for my system then in the future? First of all, that data needs to be stored, that's what I said before, so it can be a very, very large data set. Some of the data sets I have seen here are really in the petabyte range, and this is really big, especially if you have large X-ray or maybe MRTs or whatever else. So we easily can come here in, in, in ranges where we talk about a petabyte or more of data to be analyzed or be trained. This is really not unusual here. On the right, on the, on the second stage here, we have to do data cleansing or data um, 
um, preparation and analytics. That means we have to see, is this data we have collected the right one? We maybe have to label the data because a system does not automatically know what type of data is it from. So therefore, of course, uh, jobs like data scientists and data engineers who are doing data labeling, these are not always um, the, the most, let's say, f fancy things. Uh, they sound fancy, but data engineers who are just doing labeling or so, that can be somehow also a boring job because if you have to, to label a million uh, images um, uh, in your lifetime, then with uh, descriptions, what is all seen on the page on, on, the, on, the, on the image is not actually very funny. For example, um, I give you another example from another um, um, tech, not technology from another area in automotive, and uh, everybody is very eager to drive autonomous cars. You all have heard about autonomous cars, yeah? Okay. Do you know well, how the majority of that uh, training for autonomous cars is being done today? Any idea? How is it? How are the? How is the data actually collected? Of or let's say we have, we have collected a movie of 100 kilometer autobahn driving here in Germany, and what is happening then? So in the old days, actually, the movie was sent over to countries like China, India, and there, of course, people were sitting there, a company specialized on that, watching that movie, tagging and flagging each, each frame in the movie. A, f a usual movie has about 30 frames per second, so you can do the math and calculate how many frames you will collect over 100 kilometers of autobahn driving. And, and if you have to write on each of those frames what is visible on on the individual frame. This is a hell lot of work that can be done now, meanwhile, more or less also automatically. But even if you do it automatically, you have to trust the results on what actually the analytic system was doing in here. And the same is true for anything when you're doing actually such tagging and flagging. You need to have a so-called ground truth. Ground truth is the overall, let's say, ruler here for our data and our data quality. Once we have done that, then we can take that data and start with our training of a system. So the question is, how much data do we have? What is actually the achievement? What do we really want to achieve? And how much technology do we need for doing that? Is a PC, what I said before, a capable system here, even if it's a cheap system, but it takes eight weeks to do, and if it breaks in between, then I have to restart it, so I lose eight weeks of time, or is it better to take a different technology here? These are some of the discussions you have to consider here. And last but not least, the, old, the ultimate outcome will be, what do we actually want to achieve with it? Is it a recommendation system? Is it actually just a fact-finding system? Or is it something that really triggers an event? If you have, let's say, um, some, some technology that actually says, well, if this happens, and then, of course, I can see this, then I have to push a button and do something, like in an autonomous car, for example, that I have to, to, to push the brake autonomously, automatically. Or is it something, of course, I see as a recommendation engine? These are the important things. And last but not least, it always depends on the urgency and on the, let's say, danger you may have to be create, considering here on your system. So that's something, of course. So well, that means about 80%, 80% of our AI development time we are spending today on the data and all of the data preparation and all that stuff in here. So therefore, of course, that's a lot of time definitely to spend in here. Um, IBM has a foundation here. We have a lot of components here. As you can imagine, we have our own storage system. Basically, we are using a file system. It's called Spectrum Scale. Spectrum Scale is a file system that comes from traditional high-performance computing HPC. And that's also the file system you find in many of the HPC clusters around the world. And that file system in particular has the advantage that it can be tiered in various areas. So you can have, let's say, a high performance NVMe, which NVMe is one of the fastest storage we have today on the market. 
also, but of course you can have a more economic storage like SAS drives or old-fashioned SATA drives where you can build up bulks of storage and even you can include tape devices. Imagine that tape is still the most efficient way to store archived data because it doesn't take a lot of energy and secondly you have a very, very high capacity on tape and of course you can use it still within the same file system for your access. But of course, considering actually the times of access you need to have in here. On the right hand side, then we have a lot of um, software elements. Some of you have heard about that. We have, of course, um, our own uh, Watson um, ML accelerator, but we are working with a variety of companies here in between, like Kinetica, we have Julia, um, um, Scream databases. Scream, by the way, is a great thing, of course, when you want to keep a very high performance database. This is really outstanding, what I have seen here with Scream, and they have made a nice paper with LG in Korea on, on, on IBM power system here. On the other side, we have, um, of course, our frameworks. We have not our frameworks. We have the traditional frameworks like TensorFlow, Cafe2, PyTorch, but any other framework which is capable to do the job can be also implemented in here. So I think it's depending then on the development here what you are looking for. So it's an open system, but on the other hand, of course, you can also get some components very much up and running and autonomously can be installed. So uh, the major import the, the important thing is actually that you don't lose the connectivity in your data pipeline. That means within our data pipeline, we are always connected from our storage down to the way where we have our inference model. That means all systems belong to each other to a larger system. So that means you can take the advantages in order to avoid copying data from one side to the other. I have some customers, I have to say, this is really something very strange, what I can see, they are really doing still copy of data to external disk drives, haul them to a truck, send them to the other side, and then of course on the other side they upload the data then again to their other system, then a day later they send the data back again. This is sometimes, this is really happening in 2019, this is not unusual, so therefore of course uh, there are better ways to do that, but of of course, it's also also depending then on the traditional organization and on the ways actually people were acting in the past. On that chart, of course, I have more of the, let's say, the individual um, granularity of the each phases here in the data creation, data preparation phase. So these are some of the considerations I have brought in. I don't read all of them now down because uh, this is something definitely you can, can read after. But uh, I can tell you these are some of the, the important things for your consideration when planning such a system. So I say always, whenever it, whatever it takes, whatever actually your achievement should be, just look in the, um, the recommendations here and in the considerations for each of those phases so you cannot fail. Because if you, I have seen many projects where people were considering maybe, oh, that storage will last. This is, of course, enough for me. But at the end of the day, then this was the weakest part of the chain then in the IT technology. And maybe the result was not as expected. Performance was lousy or some other things happened here. So coming some to some technology here, because for me from IBM, we are also still a technology company, and the M in IBM, I have always to say, stands still for machines. Some people say differently, but of course, uh, it's still a machine company. And we have, let's say, a component here, which is our Power AC922 system. This is of some of those converged systems, as I said before, where you can combine the performance of IBM compute power in combination with the GPUs from NVIDIA. And here, of course, this is a very, let's say, um, it's, it, actually it's very simple, but on the other hand, it's, um, I was really stunned when I saw that picture two years ago, first coming from the lab. I was really, um, I said, well, um, that, uh, that doesn't sound much, but of course it was really a, a, a rule breaker in here. What we have done here, we actually opened a special link between the GPU and the, GP and, and the CPU, what I said before. 
And that link, we call it the Envy link, can um, scale up to 150 gigabyte per second. That means you can have a tremendous load of data from your, from your data AI system moved from your CPU to your GPU in a single second. That means uh, this is five times as much as you can get out of any other regular x86 system on the market today. And therefore, of course, your performance of your training and of your running time will decrease dramatically. Another effect of this, I come to that in a moment, is that you can have a global shared memory array. This is also something unusual on the CPU and GPU, because we can now, with that technology, open our memory space on the CPU, our traditional RAM, and use it in combination with our GPU. We call it large memory support. That gives you the efficiency that you can have up to four terabyte of RAM in a single system, and therefore, of course, you can imagine to do quite a lot of very high scaling um, and high demanding um, um, uh, analytics and AI calculations in here. These are some numbers here. I don't want to break on those, but of course you can, you can read them up later on anyway. Said what I said before, in a traditional system you always have to deal with a weight I.O. state. This is a traditional behavior we have seen, and this was a picture we have taken from my guys from Fraunhofer here in, in Kaiserslautern at the ITWM Institute. As you can see in a traditional run on a PC system where you have your GPUs in there, most of those systems sitting there waiting for data. That means you have a very high performance infrastructure, actually the card itself. The GPU is very powerful, but it's always waiting for data. Why? Because of the weakness of the PCI bus in the system. Every x86 system is based on PCI buses. Therefore, of course, you always have to wait on those data, or most of the time, especially if you have large uh, batch runs, large epochs, and huge images, for example, that drives especially such effects in here. And as I said before, with our GPU um, um, NV Link, we definitely can do that much, much faster. And as I said, we can now combine the GPU memory with the CPU memory, keep it in a global memory space, and that, of course, enables you to have a much, much faster and much more reliable um, system here to do your batch runs in here. That will mean, and uh, I have some, some demos here, I think, as well. So we will incre decrease the time, the time for training here by numbers. Um, yeah, we have um, this chart we have seen before. We have also here, as, as I said before, a couple of co software components. I don't want to go in much detail here, but one of the most important things is our power, um, Watson ML an, uh, an accelerated solution here, where you can have a lot of our Watson components here on your system, and you always can do some training here, can write your own code, can combine it with your own frameworks, and integrate it also with APIs from third-party companies like we have seen before here. That's something, of course, that makes it very unique and very attractive, actually, to use it in a traditional way. Otherwise, you have to set up your own networks, your own neural networks, and who actually of you have done that in before knows how much time it takes to actually maintain that in, in, a, in a traditional way when I download and when I install all those components manually. That can be somehow tricky and something, of course, very, let's say, disturbing over time. Time. Another thing is uh, we have a deep learning um, impact DLI module and also, of course, a distributed deep learning module where you can even scale, and this was an example of what we have done in Oak Ridge, with over 1,500 nodes combined to a cluster, where you can imagine that you can do a training run in sub-seconds here in questions in comparison to do so in a single or a system or a smaller cluster. That means we have a distribution here that really scales nearly linear in comparison to what is on the market today. And that gives you some of the impressions here. So we have that um, distributed deep learning here from 16 days down to se um, seven hours in, a, in, in, in such a way, comparing actually 64 systems to a single system here. That means um, that you can definitely take advantage here as well. 
Last not least, of course, we have that um, large model support, what you said before, where you definitely can take more of the GPU, CPU um, uh, RAM of your system and use it then for training runs in a shared domain. That's something, of course, I can imagine. We have um, some other examples here from research, some, the medical sieve, they call it. Imagine that you have about 10,000 images here from an um, MRI scan, so we can um, actually run with 75 million of, uh, per year of such scans, and then, of course, you can uh, select the 25 of those who are really relevant, what is actually in, uh, exciting to you. And this is something of con uh, you can do in, in a couple of, of, of seconds rather than waiting there for, for weeks or days for doing that. We are working also on other things like um, the transform Parkinson's disease care. There are a lot of other things going on, and IBM is quite excited here, especially on research on those areas. Another thing is about elderly care, elderly uh, support, not just only about home caring, but also, of course, surveillance and, of course, um, um, guidance here for patients here on their behavior. This is also some very exciting area what we are working on. So um, I think my time is nearly over, I think, but of course, maybe uh, just a, a funny thing, I'm not sure if it works. Yes, this is also something we can do with AI on our systems. This is um, another video I have included. So unfortunately, it's on, on the laptop here, it's included, so it works. It's, it's handwriting forms. It may be not something of everybody's mind in here, but that's also a very, very difficult thing to do. And uh, this system can read any kind of handwriting uh, in, 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 in sub-seconds. So we can proceed about 100,000 um, handwritten forms within an hour on a single system, transcript them to actually uh, PDFs, and extract of that handwriting then uh, what is written there. It's not just only a transcription. It's actually really understanding what's written in the text. What does it mean? So if you have, let's say, some doctors who have, let's say, some handwritings from the past, that's something maybe also you can do, take for your advantage in here. And the company we are working with here is actually a, call, a company called Planet. They are sitting in Germany, and I very, was very stunned from them because they won a European project for the European Union, and their um, job is now to do the digitalization of the European heritage. That means all of the European documents from the 11th century, from handwriting until 18-something, uh, are being uh, scanned and documented and the software, even the Vatican Library in, in Rome is actually scanned and all those documents will be translated then with their software. This is really a great thing. Okay, that's my last uh, slide here. What I can see in the future, I think we are heading forward to a digital, what I see is, is a digital universe because in the future everything will belong together. And if you talk to Gay about things like healthcare, bioscience or so, I can sure imagine that there are other factors are coming and influencing our whole research and what we are doing here, like climate change, what is the impact here on, on, on human behavior, on human genomics or whatever else, maybe also about um, other things like work or any area in our daily life can be affected. So my theory is that everything depends on each other and therefore, of course, we have to understand clearly what's to become and AI and our technology might be, let's say, a tool and a facilitator to do so. So with that, I think I can close and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I will be around at the IBM booth over there, and, and the, you can.
come up to that, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, we have also, quite, uh, on our booth, this is something, I make some advertisement, we have um, um, Jeff on the, our booth from Precision Life, and he was actually developing something, this is, as, as I said, this is not my, my, my deep insight here, but of course this was actually a software they developed here on our AC922, and you can definitely share with him some of the results in here.